Tonight, we have a special treat for you. We searched deeper in our vault and uncovered a piece of tape that we think you'll really enjoy. The program is from an author series that was produced at the Cambridge Public Library back in 1995 and features a Harvard Law School student reading from a memoir that he wrote titled, Dreams from My Father, a story of race and inheritance. This particular law school student distinguished himself as the first black editor of the Harvard Law Review, and then some years later as the first African-American president of the United States. Sit back and enjoy a special archival presentation with Barack Obama. Good evening. Thank you very much. I, uh, I noticed today as I was in the hotel room getting ready that uh, Colin Powell is also here today. Uh, we were going to coordinate our tours, uh, and uh, he was a little worried that I'd siphon off the crowds, but uh, it looks like he did okay. Um, I'm very happy to be here today, although I, I admit that when I am in uh, libraries in Cambridge, I get uh, exam flashbacks. I start getting uh, breaking out into cold sweats. But uh, this is, in fact, the first time that I've been uh, to the Cambridge Public Library, which shows you the kind of life we lead over at the law school. Uh, we don't uh, leave campus too much. Um, a little bit about m myself and the book. Uh, a little preface. Uh, as was said in the introduction, my father was a black African, and my mother uh, was a, a white American. And much of my life was spent trying to reconcile the terms of my birth, uh, that divided heritage, with the realities of race and nationality uh, tribal identities uh, that exist not just in this country but also overseas. Uh, so that this book is not so much a memoir, I think, as, as sort of a, a journey of discovery for me, some sense of trying to make sense of my family. And, and family is always a complicated thing, but it's, it was a little bit more complicated for me. Uh, and, and part of that process of me understanding my family ends up understanding the larger forces that shaped my family. Uh, the first section of the book in particular talks about my grandparents and my mother's family, uh, who grew up in uh, such uh, uh, metropolises as uh, Peru, Kansas, and uh, El Dorado, Kansas, uh, were not uh, sophisticates, were not uh, uh, even liberal. Uh, were about as mid-American as you could get. Uh, really, if you, if you look at pictures of my grandparents, and there, there's a picture on the, on the cover of the book, uh, and particularly in their older years, they look like they walked straight out of American Gothic. Uh, on the other side, my father's tribe, my father's family, came from a small Kenyan village uh, on the shores of Lake Victoria. Uh, and sometimes we forget in some of the racial conflict that takes place in this country, uh, that contact between the West and Africa, and the West in Kenya, and my father's village in particular, was relatively recent, so that my grandfather, on my father's side, was the first, uh, or one of the first, Africans, black men, to ever see and meet and have direct contact with a white person. Uh, and this happened as recently as uh, 1895 so that you have these widely divergent cultures coming together. And as a child, a lot of the conflicts that potentially arise out of that were tamped down in my life because they met in Hawaii. And they met at a time uh, that was full of idealism. It was during the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, Hawaii, as it is, had sort of almost a mythic uh, reputation of being multicultural, and so that my parents were swept up in the idealism of that time and, and the hopefulness of that time, the sense that you might be able to create in this country uh, a, a nation that was built on a sense of community and equity and fairness. And as we know, many of those dreams of my parents ended up fraying uh, as time went on. Their marriage broke apart but also, I think, the hopes and dreams of the nation began to crumble uh, in the later 60s. And so I end up coming into adolescence uh, at a time when uh, 
the tensions between the races, even in a place like Hawaii, are becoming more pronounced. And sort of the identity politics that uh, is so pronounced today uh, was already starting to uh, come to the fore. So the section that I'm going to read uh, for you right now uh, takes place during my adolescence. Uh, and I'm a very angry man, right, uh, young man, at the time that this passage takes place. Uh, you know, partly because my father is absent, partly because I'm trying to struggle, what does it mean exactly to be a black man in, an Amer in America? Uh, partly because I'm sufficiently isolated in Hawaii without a large African American community, without uh, father figures around that might guide me and steer my anger. Uh, what I end up relying on are the images and stereotypes that are coming through the media. And, and I'm having to patch together and piece together exactly what it means for me to, uh, uh, to be both African and an American. So the passage that I'm going to read right now takes place right after a party. Uh, and what's happened is, is that typically when I went to parties in high school, oftentimes there were three or four black people in a room of 300. Uh, so finally, a black friend of mine and myself decided to invite some white friends to a black party out in an army base, uh, out in uh, Schofield Barracks, one of the major army bases in Hawaii. And we immediately sense that they're a little uncomfortable being in this minority situation. Uh, you know, they're sort of trying to tap their foot to the beat. You know, and they're, they're you know, uh, being extraordinarily friendly. And uh, after a while, they decide, after about half an hour, they say, well, Barack, let's, let's get going. Uh, you know, we're feeling kind of tired. We're feeling this or that. And suddenly, th this sense that uh, what I have had to put up with every day of my life uh, is something that they find uh, so objectionable that they can't even put up with it for a day. And these are good friends of mine and, and, and uh, 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 folks who, who had uh, stood by me for many years. Uh, it, it, something is triggered in my head, and I suddenly start seeing, as I say in this passage, a new map of the world. Uh, a couple of other notes of explanation. As I work through this anger, this sense of betrayal, uh, I discover that I'm feeling that same sense of betrayal from my family. It all starts coming together. And some of the characters in the book, there will be Gramps, in this passage, rather. Uh, Gramps is my grandfather. Uh, Toot is my grandmother. Uh, that's short for Tutu, which in Hawaii means grandmother. At the time when I was born, she decided she was too young to be called Granny, so, or Grams, so we called her Toot. And the passage finally ends with me having a conversation with a close friend of my maternal grandfather, a close friend of Gramps, a black man from Kansas named Frank, uh, actually a, a, at the time a fairly well-known poet uh, named Frank Marshall Davis who had moved to Hawaii and lived there. Uh, and so I have a discussion with him about the kinds of frustrations I'm having and, and uh, he sort of schools me on uh, that I should get used to uh, these frustrations. So let me dig in. We started down the road towards town, and in the silence, my mind began to rework Ray's words that day with Kurt. All the discussions we'd had before that, the events of that night. And by the time I had dropped my friends off, I had begun to see a new map of the world, one that was frightening in its simplicity, suffocating in its implications. We were always playing on the white man's court, Ray had told me, by the white man's rules. If the principal or the coach or a teacher or Kurt wanted to spit in your face, he could because he had power and you did not. If he decided not to, if he treated you like a man or came to your defense, it was because he knew that the words you spoke, the clothes you wore, the books that you read, your ambitions and desires were already his. Whatever he decided to do, it was his decision to make, not yours, and because of that fundamental power he held over you, because it preceded and would outlast his individual motives and inclinations, any distinction 
between good and bad whites held negligible meaning. In fact, you couldn't even be sure that everything you had assumed to be an expression of your black unfettered self, the humor, the song, the behind the back pass, had been freely chosen by you. At best, these things were a refuge. At worst, a trap. Following this maddening logic, the only thing you could choose as your own was withdrawal into a smaller and smaller coil of rage until being black meant only the knowledge of your own powerlessness and your own defeat and the final irony, should you refuse this defeat and lash out at your captors, they would have a name for that too, a name that could cage you just as good, like paranoid, or militant, or violent, or nigger. Over the next few months, I looked to corroborate this nightmare vision of mine. I gathered up books from the library, Baldwin, Ellison, Hughes, Wright, Dubois. At night, I would close the door to my room, telling my grandparents I had homework to do, and there I would sit and wrestle with words, locked in suddenly desperate argument, trying to reconcile the world as I had found it with the terms of my birth. But there seemed to be no escape to be had. In every page of every book, in Bigger Thomas and Invisible Men, I kept finding the same anguish, the same doubt, a self-contempt that neither irony nor intellect seemed able to deflect. Even Dubois' learning in Baldwin's love and Langston's humor eventually succumbed to its corrosive force. Each man finally forced to doubt art's redemptive power. Each man finally forced to withdraw, one to Africa, one to Europe, one deeper into the bowels of Harlem, but all of them in the same weary flight, all of them exhausted bitter men, the devil at their heels. Only Malcolm X's autobiography seemed to offer something different. His repeated acts of self-creation spoke to me the blunt poetry of his words, his insistence on respect, promised a new and uncompromising order, martial in its discipline, forged through sheer force of will. All the other stuff, the talk of blue-eyed devils and apocalypse, was incidental to that program, I decided. Religious baggage that Malcolm himself seemed to have safely abandoned towards the end of his life. And yet, even as I imagined myself following Malcolm's call, one line in the book stayed with me. For he spoke of a wish he'd once had, the wish that the white blood that ran through him there by an act of violence might somehow be expunged. I knew that for Malcolm, that wish would never be incidental. I knew as well that traveling down the road to self-respect my own white blood would never recede into mere abstraction. So I was left to wonder what else I would be severing if and when I left my mother and my grandparents at some uncharted border. And two, if Malcolm's discovery towards the end of his life that some whites might live beside him as brothers in Islam seemed to offer some hope of eventual reconciliation, that hope appeared in a distant future, in a far off land. Where were the people who would work towards this future and populate this new world? After a basketball at the university one day, Ray and I happened to strike up a conversation with a tall, gaunt man ma named Malik, who played with us now and again. Malik mentioned that he was a follower of the Nation of Islam. But that since Malcolm had died and he had moved to Hawaii, he no longer went to mosque or political meetings, although he still sought comfort in solitary prayer. One of the guys sitting nearby must have overheard us, for he leaned over with a sagacious expression on his face. Y'all talking about Malcolm, huh? Malcolm tells us like it is, no doubt about it. Yeah, another guy said, but I tell you what, you won't see me moving to no African jungle anytime soon. Or some goddamn desert somewhere sitting on a carpet with a bunch of Arabs, no sir. And you, you won't see me stop eating no ribs either. <laughs> Gotta have them ribs. And pussy too. Don't Malcolm talk about no pussy? Now you know that ain't gonna work. 
I noticed Ray laughing and looked at him sternly. What are you laughing at? I said to him. You never even read Malcolm. You don't even know what he says. Ray grabbed the basketball out of my hand and headed for the opposite rim. I don't need no books to tell me how to be black, he shouted over his head. I started to answer, then turned to Malik, expecting some words of support. But the Muslim said nothing, his bony face set in a faraway smile. I decided to keep my own counsel after that, learning to disguise my feverish mood. A few weeks later, though, I awoke to the sound of an argument in the kitchen, my grandmother's voice barely audible, followed by my grandfather's deep growl. I opened my door to see Toot, that's my grandmother, entering their bedroom to get dressed for work. I asked her what was wrong. Nothing. Your grandfather just doesn't want me to drive me to work this morning, that's all. I entered the kitchen and saw Gramps was muttering under his breath. He poured himself a cup of coffee as I told him that I'd be willing to give Toot a ride to work if he was feeling tired. This was a bold offer, for I did not like to wake up early. He scowled at my suggestion. That's not the point. She just wants to make me feel bad. I'm sure that's not it, Gramps. Of course it is. He sipped from his coffee. She's been catching the bus ever since she started at the bank. She said it was more convenient. And now, just because she gets pestered a little, she wants to change everything. Toot's diminutive figure hovered in the hall, peering at us from behind her bifocals. That's not true, Stanley. I took Toot into the other room and asked her what had happened. A man asked me for money yesterday while I was waiting for the bus. That's all? Toot's lips pursed with irritation. He was very aggressive, Barry, very aggressive. I gave him a dollar and he kept asking. If the bus hadn't come, why, I think he might have hit me over the head. Gramps was rinsing his cup when I returned to the kitchen. His back was turned to me. Listen, I said, Gramps, why don't you just let me give her a ride after all? She seems pretty upset. By a panhandler? Yeah, I know, but it's probably a little scary for her seeing some man block her way. It's really no big deal. He turned around and I saw now that he was shaking. It is a big deal. It's a big deal to me. She's been bothered by men before. You know why she's so scared this time? I'll tell you why. Before you came in, she told me the fellow was black. He whispered the word. That's the real reason why she's bothered. And I just don't think that's right. His words were like a fist in my stomach, and I wobbled to regain my composure. In my steadiest voice, I told him that such an attitude bothered me too, but assured him that Toot's fears would pass and that we should give her a ride in the meantime. Gramps slumped into a chair in the living room and said he was sorry he had told me. Before my eyes, he grew small and old and very sad. I put my hand on his shoulder and told him that it was all right. I understood. We remained like that for several minutes in painful silence. Finally, he insisted that he drive Toot after all and, I, and struggled up from his seat to get dressed. After they left, though, I sat on the edge of my bed and thought about my grandparents. They had sacrificed again and again for me. They had poured all their lingering hopes into my success. Never had they given me reason to doubt their love, and I doubted if they ever would. And yet I knew that men who might easily have been my brothers could still inspire their rawest fears. That night, I drove into Waikiki, past the bright-lit hotels and down towards the Alawai Canal. It took me a while to recognize the house with its wobbly porch and low-pitched roof. 
Inside, the light was on, and I could see Frank sitting in his overstuffed chair, a book of poetry in his lap, his reading glasses slipping down his nose. I sat in the car, watching him for a time, then finally got out and tapped on the door. The old man barely looked up. 